Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Crusades from the Byzantine Perspective by Kings and Generals. So, the last episode in this series was Crusades from the Muslim Perspective. And I don't want to repeat myself too much. You know, if you want to see my perspectives on that, go and watch that video, the last one in this series. But I found it very interesting to get a different perspective on the uh, Crusades, which... You know, speaking from my experience living in the Western world, I usually get from a sort of Western Christian uh, perspective. That's usually how the history is shown to me. Um, and so I found that very interesting and entertaining. Uh, and today we're getting the Byzantine perspective, which I suspect will also be fairly different from the Western Christian perspective that I'm more familiar with. So yeah, I'm excited to jump into this one. Uh, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's jump into this reaction. In our last video, we explored the Muslim perspective of the Crusades and how mm. it impacted the Holy Lands for generations. This time, we will review the relationship between the Latins and the Eastern Roman Empire. How did the constant shift from allies to rivals affect the Byzantine populace? And what caused the rift, which would eventually spiral out of control as the Crusaders turned from saviors to occupiers? Right. I think this would be a very interesting look because from the Muslim perspective, while it is true, uh, well, at least according to their last video, that Muslim hostility towards the Crusaders grew, as uh, the Crusaders occupied the Holy Lands, as in initially the Muslims were not as hostile as they became um, due to the occupation, um, the relationship with the Byzantines is obviously a little different. You know, the Crusaders were initially brought in as allies. You know, they were brought in to help, uh, you know, bring back Byzantine territory, lost Byzantine territory. Um, but then... Almost immediately, some tensions emerged between the Western Crusaders and uh, the Byzantine Empire, and those tensions would be very hot at times and lead to some serious conflict. So they sort of have a, uh, a complex relationship, you could say. Alongside our video today, our sponsor Magellan TV mm. has a great documentary with more details on the journey of the Crusaders. All right, well, you guys know the deal. Uh, I will link to this video by Kings and Generals in the description. Uh, if you guys want to show them some support for making these fantastic videos, please go and check out their video. Go give them a like, subscribe to their channel, uh, and check out their sponsor, which is linked in the description of their video, and their link is on the screen right now. So please go show them some support. Description. In 968... The Holy Roman Emperor Otto II sent the Bishop of Cremona, Liutprand, to forge a marriage alliance with the Eastern Roman Empire. When the emissary arrived at Constantinople, he was forced to stand in the rain for hours and then was accommodated in a crumbling castle before he finally met Emperor Nikiforos II Phocas, Yikes. who insulted and dismissed him. Liutprand was not even allowed to purchase the famous purple cloth since it was considered too precious for barbarians. Wow. As we can see, even before the East-West Schism and Crusades, the Byzantines were notoriously arrogant towards any people who were not their own. Yes, um, that's a very good example, and it gives us a very good look at how the Byzantines viewed themselves and everybody else. So, you know, the Byzantines looked at themselves as the inheritors of the legacy of the Roman Empire. And I think fairly, I mean, they were the Eastern Roman Empire. The West fell, basically, um, and the Eastern Roman Empire was all that remained. Though, of course, um, you know, early on following the fall of the West, the Eastern Roman Empire would reclaim a lot of the lost territory. So I, I think fairly the Byzantines viewed themselves as the Romans, you know, they were the Roman Empire, or at least what remained of it. And so they held a lot of that Roman arrogance, I think we would call it. Um, the Romans were not very good at diplomacy. I mean, they were good at diplomacy in that they got their way, but 
They mostly did that by strong-arming everybody around them. They were not very tactful. <laughs> the Romans would come in, say, look, we're the Romans, we're better than you, and we'll get what we want. And uh, they would get what they wanted through sheer force. Um, the Byzantines were, I think, quite similar even after hundreds of years of decline. Um, we can see how they treat um, the Western Europeans. Now, of course, at this point, we have the Holy Roman Empire uh, in, you know, Central Western Europe. And so that is sort of a competitor to the legacy of the Romans. Um, the Byzantines, I don't think, felt felt super challenged by that. You know, they felt their claim was more legitimate, and they still held on to a lot of that Roman arrogance. Although, of course, over time, Byzantine power will continue to decline, whereas the Western European powers will get stronger in contrast. Um, so it's sort of a changing relationship, but we can sort of see how the Byzantines still held on to that Roman attitude um, of viewing themselves as superior and those around them as barbarians, regardless of the political reality. Um, though, and you know, I'm not too knowledgeable on this, I'm sure those attitudes would change as the Byzantine Empire continued to decline over the years. An attitude which was sure to sour the relations with potential military or trade partners. But the relations between the East and West were particularly complicated, as both sides saw each other as a necessary evil. Mm. Pragmatism led to compromise, but in these conditions, time and proximity brought out the worst in both parties. For centuries, Catholic and Orthodox communities had very limited contact, as both were mostly concerned with their regional enemies. But the Norman and Seljuk invasions led to a new level of desperation for the newly founded Komnenian dynasty, which opened a bridge between these worlds. Luckily for us today, the five major historians who characterized this era were very talented writers with unique access to the state, who covered the Crusader period extensively. Great. Anna Komnene, the daughter of Alexios, John Kinematos, a bureaucrat and confidant of Manuel I, Nikitas Honiatis, a judge and civil servant, Michael Selos, a savant and counselor, and finally, George Acropolites, a chancellor and commander. I love the presentation of the sources or the historians we're going to be looking at. Uh, I really enjoyed that in the video on Muslim perspectives that, you know, we looked at individual Muslim chroniclers and historians, and we looked about how their culture where they lived, and their personal experiences sort of explained uh, the history that they wrote, uh, their opinions, and their individual perspective. Um, I thought that was really insightful. And so, yeah, it seems like we're getting something similar here, which uh, is really great. The first major challenge that Alexios Komnenos faced was the Norman invasion of Robert Giscard in 1081, which had three major implications. Following the defeat at the Battle of Dyrrhachium, the Roman manpower was severely depleted, forcing them to rely on mercenaries. As a direct result, Alexios used diplomacy and cunning to strike a deal with Venice, who agreed to act as the imperial navy in the Adriatic, in return for exclusive trading rights. Yeah, we were just talking about how, you know, the Romans often just use pure force instead of diplomacy, at least when they were at, you know, their height of power. Alexios Komnenos is basically the exact opposite of that. You know, he was very aware, he had to be, that his empire was um, at a very vulnerable state. Um, he did not have that much manpower at his disposal. And so Alexios was very cunning and very talented uh, in his ability to use diplomacy to solve issues that would otherwise be solved through direct military conflict, which he knew he couldn't afford. And so what we've seen so far from Alexios uh, is that, you know, he is very skilled at diplomacy. Um, he has to be, you know, for the survival of his empire. Additionally, Alexios bribed many Normans who deserted and joined his army and court. The war was won with the Battle of Larissa, but suddenly, the Byzantine populace found out they had more contact with Western Europe than ever before. Mm. The circumstance of the West's arrival led to the first major prejudice of the state and people towards the newcomers, 
that they were greedy and opportunistic. Hmm. Those traits would become a staple and were repeated by virtually every Eastern chronicler. Even when describing Norman allies, the Roman court labelled them as the barbarians bearing the double-edged sword on their shoulders. A people that should not be trusted and should be seen as distinctly other. The yeah, and this is um, one part of that Roman tradition that I talked about. I mean, the Romans would always refer to those other than them, with a few exceptions, as barbarians. It didn't matter how powerful uh, the country or tribe or state they were referring to was, they were barbarians. And so the Byzantines sort of uh, maintained that. Though, you know, it is worth noting that, at least as we've seen in the First Crusade, and I know it gets worse, the Crusaders didn't behave themselves, you know, uh, that well around the Byzantines. There wasn't that much regard for uh, the Byzantine Empire, even though they were, you know, essentially there to help. These fears were not unfounded, as the Normans, hired for their incredible martial prowess, continuously betrayed them by carving out their own domains in Anatolia, further yep. cementing the animosity between both parties. As for the Venetians, who arrived at the coastal cities and established their own colonies, at first some chroniclers like Anna Komnena were surprised at their high levels of loyalty, bravery and economic resourcefulness. Others regarded them as poor cousins of the empire, who were not quite barbaric, but were almost as crude and ill-mannered as other westerners. <laughs> some merchants and guild artisans quickly became envious of the Venetian success and demanded that the Italians pay the same trade tax as the locals did, otherwise the Roman economy would soon become dependent on the foreigners. But it was the belief that they were inferior that made the court ignore such warnings. Mm. It is important to remember that the average denizen of Constantinople was walking amongst the marble masterpieces of the ancient world, prayed in the most beautiful churches in Christianity, filled with sacred relics, the aristocracy read Aristotle and the Iliad, and all citizens felt the protection of the massive Theodosian walls. From there, Exactly. I mean, the Byzantines were the heir to the ancient Greek and ancient Roman legacies, um, and they could see it all around them. You know, being in that environment, you, you can kind of see how it might go to your head. Not to mention, regardless of the disrepair of the entire empire, you know, we have accounts from, uh, you know, diplomats um, and scholars throughout Europe who would go from their, you know, countries in Europe and Western, Central, Eastern Europe to Constantinople, and they would write about the splendor of the Byzantine court, the Hagia Sophia, the churches. I mean, it was all very impressive. Um, you know, I mean, it had all been built in a time of... Uh, wealth, at least a lot more wealth than they had um, in the medieval period, or at least at this point in the medieval period. Uh, and so it definitely was very impressive to outsiders, even if the empire as a whole was quite weak at this point. Their perspective, everyone else was uncultured and would fade away in time. Mm. Traditional Roman warfare proved inefficient against the Seljuk threat. So Alexios used his treasury, cunning agents and relics to attract the attention of Western Europe, which was catalyzed by the preaching of Urban II and Peter the Hermit. Over 100,000 men, women and children entered Byzantine lands and crossed into Anatolia, described by Anna as the Celts, as one might guess, are in any case an exceptionally hot-headed race and passionate, <laughs> but let them once find an inducement and they become irresistible. Initially, this was a well-coordinated operation, in which the Emperor supplied various Crusader contingents as they made their way to the Holy Land. But in one crucial moment, history changed forever. Alexios was firmly in charge, but as he made his way towards the Siege of Antioch, he was met by one of the Crusader leaders, who deserted and told Alexios that the situation was hopeless. It seemed that the First Crusade was over, so the army turned back. But once they arrived at Constantinople, news arrived that the Franks had captured the city and <laughs> kept it for themselves. Wow. That is the way of all the barbarians, their mouths gape wide for gifts and money, 
but they have no intention whatever of doing the things for which the money is offered. <laughs> Envoys were sent, demanding that the Latins keep the oath they swore and return the great city to the Empire. But in response, the barbarian lunatic in his frenzied rage absolutely refused to listen. He could not bear either the truth of these words or the frankness of the envoys, and immediately reacted in the Frankish way. Glorying in his own boastfulness, he babbled that he would set his throne high above the stars and threatened to bore with his spear point through the walls of Babylon. He spoke with emphasis of his might, mouthing out the words like a tragic actor, how he was undaunted, how no one could withstand him. He confidently assured the envoys that whatever happened, he would never release his grip on Antioch, that all Romans were to him nothing more than ants, the feeblest of living things. Despite the eventual success of the crusade, it marked the moment when the West turned from a necessary evil to an existential threat, one which consumed the minds of the nobles and commoners alike until the very end of the empire. Yeah, I mean, of course, from this point onward, Western Europe would continue to gain power relatively, and the Eastern Romans, the Byzantine Empire, would continue to decline until it no longer existed a few hundred years from the First Crusade. Um, and, I mean, part of that was due to competition and direct conflict with the rest of Europe, though, of course... More of it is due to conflict with their eastern Muslim neighbors and eventual domination by the Ottomans. So it, it is a very complex relationship. And you can just hear in all the Byzantine accounts of uh, the Franks or the other Europeans, the, uh, the condescension, <laughs> the low esteem in which the Byzantines hold the rest of Europe. Um, you know, not only do they call them barbarians, but they really do see them as uncultured, poor-mannered, you know, deceitful barbarians. John II Komnenos had the difficult task of filling his father's shoes and restoring balance to the empire. He waged successful wars against the Turks, Crusaders and Hungarians, but in his attempts to put the Venetians in check, he angered his greatest naval and trading partner. Mm, and of course, during you know, this medieval era into the Renaissance, Venice would be a um, pretty important power in the Mediterranean region, particularly economically. You know, they are, um, as you can see, a rather small territory, but, you know, they would be very important traders throughout the Mediterranean. So, you know, you definitely would rather have them on your side, I think, than against you. In 1124, he denied the privileges granted by Alexios without building a formidable navy in case the Venetians contested it. They not only did so, but also plundered the islands of Rhodes, Chios, uh -oh. Samos, Lesbos, and even captured Kefalonia, before John reaffirmed their rights and even expanded their quarter in Constantinople. By that time, however, both sides looked at each other suspiciously and wondered mm. how they could exploit one another rather than having a mutually beneficial relationship. The final war John started saw him muster a giant force which marched towards Antioch. But along the way, the emperor went on a boar hunt in the Tarsus Mountains, where he accidentally cut himself on a poison arrow. He died a few days later, and his last act was to choose his younger son, Manuel, as his successor, instead of his brother Isaac, in line with the AIMA prophecy which claimed that the name of each successor in the empire had to align with the Greek word for blood. It was Manuel who would turn the partnership with the West to a complete dependency in his hopes to restore the Roman Empire. Uh -oh. The third Comnenian ruler was obsessed with the Latin world and spent the rich treasury of his predecessor in an attempt to forge powerful alliances. Mm. He invited numerous foreigners to his court, adopted their customs, hosted jousting tournaments, allied the papacy, ransomed Latin knights, picked Latin brides for... Interesting. I mean, this is very much... Um, and you, you always see this. You always see certain rulers who sort of flip the script, but this is very different than the typical Roman obstinacy and arrogance. Um, Manuel, I suppose he's figured... I mean, what we're doing right now clearly isn't working. Um, we don't need competition with the West. We need... 
to be allies with them. We need to adopt what they're doing because it's working. Um, but, I mean, in the long run, <laughs> his strategy didn't work either, but it's definitely interesting to see a sort of a different perspective on it. His family, while he married Maria of Antioch. He planned the diplomatic annexation of Hungary, whose ruler, Bela, was renamed to Alexios to fit the prophecy after he was designated as his heir. Hmm. He built a massive fleet, which he used to counter the growing Venetian monopoly hmm. by crushing their fleet in 1171 at Hios, and he used okay. it six years later in an attempt to reconquer Egypt, which ultimately failed. To make up for the soured Venetian relations, Manuel invited Pisan and Genoese merchants who received their own quarters. The emperor focused on the imperial external problems while completely neglecting the domestic situation, and while he had numerous allies abroad, the majority of his nobles, clergy, and commoners hated him. In their eyes, the state favored the Western army, navy, and merchants. In the capital, Venetians and other Italians were no longer seen as threats, but enemies. Yeah, yeah I can see how that would be the case. You know, it is important to form alliances abroad, but you need to make sure that it's not at the expense of your popularity with your subjects, particularly important subjects like your nobles, because they are far closer to home. Uh, and when push comes to shove, you know, they're the ones who are close enough to do a coup and execute you, or at least undermine your rule in some way. So, you know, we, we've seen instances of this before, but, you know, I'm sure the, the people and upper class of Constantinople was very much not pleased about Manuel's sort of Western tendencies. Um, a lot of them probably still held that typical Roman attitude of superiority. And, you know, to, to be fair, I'm not, like, judging them for that. I'm not making a moral judgment. You know, they had been around for a long time, as in they, the Romans. So, you know, perhaps they had a reason to feel superior. They're, they're thinking, we've been around longer than any of you European barbarians. We know how to do things. Um, and Manuel is taking, like I said, a very different approach to that. Um, so I can see why he would be quite unpopular with his own subjects. They didn't contact the same enemies the state fought on the boundaries of the empire. What they saw were rich Latins who stole their jobs and carried Roman wealth back to their homeland. Mm. The colonies were under the state's protection and featured entire communities with their own Catholic churches and clergy. Wow. Despite wow. being located in the heart of the empire, the colonies were under foreign jurisdiction, and any crimes committed against them were resolved by an Italian judge. Okay, that's that's actually really interesting. That's sort of a step further. You know, not only is Manuel adopting some Western customs and traditions, like jousting and all that kind of stuff, but he is giving these foreigners communities in his empire where they have their own jurisdiction, both secular and religious. Catholic churches um, are allowed to operate, and these foreigners are allowed to establish their own, establish and administer their own systems of law within his territory. That is uh, pretty far to go for, um, you know, people who are not even subjects of your empire traditionally. Merchants could marry into noble families and even buy their own titles. And while they continued to be a minor player in Byzantine politics, it demonstrated a level of social mobility unattainable for the ordinary Roman citizen. Mm. William of Tyre praises Manuel, describing him as a great-souled man of incomparable energy, who relied so implicitly on the Latins' fidelity and ability that he passed over the Greeks as soft and effeminate and entrusted hmm. important affairs to the Latins alone. By the end of his reign, the treasury was empty, the church union failed, Ooh. the Hungarian inheritance failed, the diplomacy with the Kievan Rus won over only Galicia, the expansion in Italy was negligible, the Egyptian invasion failed, the merchant republics felt threatened, the Pope allied with the German Emperor, who hated Byzantium, and <laughs> most of all, a quarter of the army was lost during the Battle of Myriakephalon against the Sultanate of Rum. Oh my. The stage was set for a massive implosion. Manuel, a seemingly quite ambitious guy. I mean, that was a lot of projects we just listed. 
but also uh, seemingly a failure of an emperor because most of those projects went absolutely nowhere. Releasing decades of pent-up pressure. Upon Manuel's death, Byzantium was left in the hands of his Latin wife, Maria of Antioch, uh -oh. who ruled as regent since their son Alexios was only 11. Within two years, his uncle Andronikos emerged from his exile and led a popular uprising in the capital, catalyzing the hatred towards foreigners, which spilled out into one of the most brutal massacres in history. Yeah, I mean, that that's, that's horrific, that's brutal, you know, any massacre of this is unjustified, but it's not surprising, right, given the events we've seen. We could see... Uh, and maybe this is only in retrospect, but I imagine if you were on the streets at the time, you could sense this. We could see the tension building up with every step Manuel took as, you know, the native population, both, you know, the commoners and the nobles were getting extremely frustrated with his actions. So it's, you know, I, I thought they might rise up during his reign, but it's unsurprising, like, that something like this would happen eventually. According to some estimates, more people died that day than in the Nika riots, sack of Constantinople, Jesus. and fall of Constantinople combined. In the eyes of the West, this was a brutal takeover, which replaced the pro-Latin regime with a very antagonistic one. The Holy wow. Roman Empire... That's, I mean, that's even more brutal than I expected then. Those, if that's true, those are some big numbers, so... Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's a horrific event. ...are threatened with invasion. Hungary conquered much of the border territories, mm. and a new Norman invasion sacked the second city of the empire in a devastating manner. 7,000 were slain, relics were destroyed, women were raped, and the invaders were seen urinating on the streets. Jesus. In the words of Nikitas Honietis, between us and them, the greatest gulf of disagreement has been fixed and we are separated in purpose and diametrically opposed, even though we are closely associated and frequently share the same dwelling. Their inordinate hatred for us and our excessive disagreement with them allowed for no humane feeling between us. Mm. The following years would see the empire crack as pretender after pretender fought for the throne. Eventually, a 21-year-old pretender would make his way towards the assembling Fourth Crusade and make ridiculous promises of riches and church union if they would give him the throne. Hmm. The Crusaders and Venetians accepted and accomplished the task, only to receive orders and empty threats before the <laughs> pretender was assassinated. Once again, the pendulum swung as a pro-Western regime was replaced with one that used them and vowed to destroy them. Yeah, I mean, this is... You know, you can just see the decline of the Byzantines in real time. It just continues to get worse and worse for them. And they continue to grow weaker in comparison to their Western counterparts. Uh, and now, you know, they're sort of under the thumb of their uh, Western neighbors who really hold a lot of power over them at this point. Which led to the 1204 sack of Constantinople, an event which some contemporaries describe as the fall of Troy. In the beginning of his description of the sack, Poniatis references Solon, an ancient Athenian statesman. He reveals how Solon warned of the rise of tyranny, recognizing that it was easier to eradicate an emerging evil in the very beginning and thus prevent it taking root than to cut it away and destroy it after it has grown and mm. become very strong. When Solon's protestations were ignored, he warned that the Athenians would not be able to blame the gods for their future suffering. He continues to paint a savage picture where, maddened by war and murderous in spirit, boasting terribly, barking like Cerberus and exhaling like Haron. We recommend you check out our video on what was lost during the sack to get a sense of how damaging these events were, not only to the Byzantine state, but its identity. Yeah, I mean... I don't know too much about this time period, but of course, even I'm familiar with uh, the sack of Constantinople and how much of a major uh, and damaging event it was to the Byzantines. Um, you know, extremely brutal, um, you know, very, like I said, damaging both in material terms, um, property uh, and people, you know, lives lost, 
and in terms of the Byzantine psyche. When Nicetas fled to Nicaea, he was surprised to find out that he was shunned by its citizens, who wow. blamed the fate of the now fallen empire on the decisions of its senate. Another chronicler by the name of George Acropolites recounts, It seems, O Italians, that you no longer remember our ancient harmony, but no other nations were ever as harmonious as the Graeci and the Italians. And this was only to be expected, for science and learning came to the Italians from the Graeci. And after that point, so that they need not use their ethnic names, a new Rome was built to complement the elder one, so that all could be called Romans after the common name of such great cities, and have the same faith and the same name for it. And It's sort of really interesting getting a look at him talking about ethnicity in a way that we would recognize, sort of, because a lot of times talk of ethnicity and nationality is very different than we would interpret it or non-existent in this time period. And so it's really interesting to hear him talk about how the identity of Roman was a sort of unifying identity that unified, you know, the Greeks who are us, the Byzantines, and the Italians who are, you know, you, the Westerners. Um, yeah, that's sort of fascinating. And just as they received that noble name from Christ, so too did they take upon themselves the national name, and everything else was common to them. The magistries, laws, literature, city councils, law courts, piety itself, so that there was nothing that was not common to those of the elder and new Rome. Jeez. But oh, how things have changed. <laughs> the following five decades were difficult, but mm. the new generation learned to live in the shattered remnant of Byzantium. Recall yeah, I mean, look. <laughs> It's, you know, looking at Byzantine history is, I mean, there's disaster after disaster, but it exists, it survives for an extremely long period of time, and so they just have to learn to live with it, you know? There's no um, escaping, they have to live with the world uh, that is being created by new powers arising, you know, new powers growing stronger around them, their neighbors taking their territory, they can't do anything about it. The Byzantines just have to learn to live with it, and they do live with it for um, a very long period of time. Calling its ancient glory days, and despising what they now called the humiliated generation, the new Latin states were forced to keep almost all of the old customs, as wow. the two were forced into an uneasy alliance against Bulgaria and other threats. Eventually, Constantinople was reconquered in 1261, but the scars of the last two centuries would never heal. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty commonly stated, or at least I've heard it, that the Byzantines never really recovered from that sacking of Rome, you know? I mean, they survived for a while afterwards, but they would never truly recover. Future crusades bypassed Byzantium, choosing to directly sail to the Holy Lands, until the arrival of the Ottomans. Ironically, the Crusades of Nicopolis and Varna saw most of the Catholic world unite to aid the Romans, who worried more about the Latins than the Sultans. Hmm. The latter crusade was on the brink of saving Constantinople before the King of Poland, Lithuania and Hungary died in battle. This momentary distraction allowed the Catholic Constantine XI to retake Athens, but only a few years later, he would witness the end of the Eastern Roman Empire. Our mini-series on this topic will continue in the near future, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. All right, and there you go. The end of the Byzantine Empire. Um, we covered quite a long period of time in this one. It was a little different from the Muslim perspective video. Um, different, uh, but obviously in substance, but also in how it was sort of organized. But... It was still very uh, interesting, you know, a lot of insight into the Byzantine position and Byzantine perspectives, which I find really fascinating. And we made it to the end of the Byzantine Empire, um, or sort of almost the end, um, the conquest by the Ottomans. And while it is a shame that such a long-standing empire uh, fell, you know, all empires fall eventually, and it is a little refreshing to see <laughs> the Ottomans show up and to have an actually powerful empire back in the region for once. 
Um, they can stand up to its neighbors. Uh, in contrast to the Byzantines, who had been basically floundering for hundreds and hundreds of years, of course, you know, the Ottomans would end up in the same position um, not that far into the future. Um, so yeah, really fascinating video. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. Uh, leave a like on this video and hit the subscribe button. I hope all you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.